Welcome to CM Live. This is Joe Loria reporting from London. We're standing in front of the Ecuador Embassy where on June 19, 2012, Julian Assange sought and ultimately received political asylum. He stayed here for seven years. It was in this building and from this balcony above us where Julian Assange addressed his supporters that were aligned across this street many days during those seven years. Here, Assange announced that the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention had ruled, in fact, that he was being arbitrarily detained and that the United Kingdom should release him and actually pay him compensation. That was a triumphant day for Assange. Of course, the British government ignored that ruling. It was also here in this building where Julian Assange worked running WikiLeaks. This was the headquarters of WikiLeaks for seven years and Julian also lived in a very small room inside the embassy. He had health problems while he was here. The British government said he could leave anytime he wanted to to get uh, an MRI for a bad shoulder, to get dental work, but they would arrest him if he left. He was only wanted at the time for skipping bail, a very minor charge, but of course we knew that in fact he was here in this embassy because he'd lost the case at the UK Supreme Court to be extradited back to Sweden. And his fear was, has now been verified, his fear was that Sweden would then extradite him onward to the United States. So Julian Assange stayed here, wanted Sweden prosecutors to come here and to interview him. They refused under pressure from the British government, as we know from the reporting of Stefania Maurizi, the Italian journalist. Ultimately, Sweden did come and interview him the embassy. There was never any charge against him of rape or anything else. Those charges were dropped three times and Julian remained in this embassy working until the change of government in Ecuador. The government of Rafael Correa gave him the political asylum where he legally stayed inside this embassy even though the police shortly after 2012 threatened to come into the embassy and arrest Assange which would have been a major violation of the Vienna Convention. That never happened. But when the new government came in of Lenin Moreno, Moreno, within a short period of time, cut off Julian's access to the world. He had no longer had internet access. That was in March 2018. And that's when Julian Assange stopped communicating with the world. Effectively, he could no longer run WikiLeaks, even though he was still legally, and at that time, safely inside the embassy. But conditions grew worse. The staff treated him more and more poorly. People who came to visit him were being harassed. They had to give their telephones. As we now know, it was here that the CIA ultimately contracted with UC Global, which was originally hired by the government of Korea to provide security for Julian Assange. But that was later turned into a way to spy on Julian Assange, including his conversations in this building with his lawyers, with his doctors, with friends who visited him. All of that at some point later on became a 24-7 live feed back to the CIA. So Julian Assange's rights were violated in here, not only by the UN ruling that he was being arbitrarily detained, but now that we know from testimony in the UC Global case in Spain and also from Yahoo News reporting that while Julian was in this embassy, the CIA seriously discussed kidnapping him from here or poisoning him. When Stella Morris at the time, now Stella Assange, was visiting with their first child, she was warned by one of the staff members here at the embassy not to return because they were stealing nappies out of the rubbish to try to get DNA on Julian Assange. It was not safe for her to return and she did not return. So Julian stayed here until that day, April 11, 2019, when the Ecuadorian government in fact gave permission to the British police, the London police, to march into this building to arrest Julian Assange. Assange resisted being arrested and he was literally dragged out by about six cops. They, down these front steps that we'll show you in a moment is where he was brought out and put into a van with smiling policemen, laughing policemen. He was driven off to Belmarsh Prison. The United States that day unveiled the indictment that WikiLeaks had said since 2010 was being prepared with a grand jury, but the Obama administration refused to indict him. Then Vice President Joe Biden said on Meet the Press television show in the United States, NBC, in December, December 10, 2010, that they could not arrest Assange unless they could prove that he actually stole the documents. But if he just received them from a source, which was Chelsea Manning, they could not arrest him. They could not indict him. And in fact, he was not indicted. It was the Trump administration 
after the 2017 release of Vault 7, which really infuriated the CIA, particularly the Mike Pompeo, the then director of the CIA, that led to these discussions to kill or kidnap him, which of course never happened. Julian's rights then were taken away by Moreno. He was ultimately arrested and the U.S. unveiled that indictment that same day. He's been since that day in April 2019 in Belmarsh Prison High Security ever since. He's gone through the extradition process to lower court. The lower court ruled in favor of the United States on every point of law, but the judge, Vanessa Barretza, found that extraditing Assange to a terrible U.S. prison in the mental condition he was in, highly suicidal, was oppressive and she denied the extradition. The U.S. appealed, went to the high court. The high court agreed with everything Beretta said, but they believed assurances by the United States government to the British government made after the decision by Beretta that they would actually treat him humanely, would not put him in a high security prison and would give him adequate health care. We do know that if he goes to the United States, he will be held during pre-trial detention and during the trial of the Alexander Detention Center. We know from Yancey Ellis' testimony during the extradition hearing that there's no doctor on the side at ADC. Now, Julian Assange suffered a mini stroke on the first day of that high court hearing. So in fact, he would not have the kind of response from a medical team that would be necessary to try to prevent a more damaging episode if that should happen. Julian Assange's case after he lost in the high court, they appealed to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court denied that hearing. It was sent back to the lower court that originally decided not to extradite Assange, but this was a formality. They sent the extradition order on to Priti Patel, the Home Secretary of Britain. She is now sitting on this. There have been submissions made by Assange's team. There have been petitions from Assange. There have been a whole slew of human rights organizations, press freedom organizations, that have been appealing to Priti Patel not to extradite Assange, but she could make that decision at any moment. We are filming on Sunday, and she has until Tuesday to make that decision, we understand. We will, of course, report on that when it happens, but that's not the end of the road legally for Julian Assange. That decision can be appealed, Stella Assange said, at a cinema opening that we attended earlier this month. Also, they can appeal those points that Vanessa Barretz, the local court judge, agreed with the United States on, which and deal with things, press freedom, First Amendment, the fact that this is a political offense, which goes against the U.S.-U.K. extradition treaty, uh, the fact that he was spied on by CIA, that the CIA then dis seriously discussed killing him, the state of his health, all of these issues can be brought to the high court, which can or cannot, depending on what they decide, accept this appeal. That's where we are right now, waiting for Priti Patel's decision and how the legal team of Julian Assange will respond. Now let's walk over to the entrance of the embassy. Now we're gonna politely knock or ring the bell. It's a Sunday, we're hoping that it's quiet. If there's someone there uh, and we're let in, we're going to ask whether we can go to see the room where Julian Assange lived, the conference room where he met many of his guests, including his lawyers and doctors where he was indeed spied on. I'm standing now in front of number three, Hans Crescent. This is where his supporters were. This is where the police van was, a very narrow street where they arrested him. That night before, and nights before we knew something was up, there were unmarked cars here. Cassandra Fairbanks, who was one of the witnesses for Assange in the extradition hearing, was here in London and went up to, clearly there were police that were scoping the building out. There was also an incident in around that time, uh, earlier, a year earlier, where there was an attempted break-in here that WikiLeaks has confirmed. It failed. Let's go upstairs. I'm pressing the reception button. No, I don't see anyone, but let's see. Embassy of Ecuador. There is no one at the concierge desk. It looks pretty dark in there. Yeah. But maybe we can get somebody who previously worked in the embassy. They're deadly serious about storming. Mm -hmm. They're also deadly serious about doing it before Quito makes an announcement. They don't have time. And that person who used to work in the Ecuadorian embassy was Fidel Navarrez, who was the consul in 2012 and worked six years in the embassy. And we're very happy to have Fidel join us now on CN Live. Fidel, thank you for coming to speak with us about the years that Julian spent at the embassy. 
tell us how you first met Julian Assange, what that early period was like in terms of him getting uh, applying and then getting the asylum from the Ecuadorian government of Rafael Correa at the time. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor, a pleasure. I met Julian before he came to us for asylum in my embassy. I met him a whole year before 2012. I'm in, in 2011, my government approached WikiLeaks regarding the cable gate. Uh -huh. uh, you mm -hmm. must remember that at the beginning of the cable gate, WikiLeaks was publishing the cables in agreement with different media around the world. Basically, in each country, they choose certain media in order to partner the publication. And my government was really concerned about the uh, media that were publishing those, those cables in Ecuador. They were basically picturing or misinforming. We, we had that feeling about the whole cable gate relating to Ecuador. So we approached WikiLeaks basically saying, we would like to see everything. We would like to everything to be there for the public to see. Is that possible? And it was, it was. I think we were the, the first country to have all the cables available, accessible, that did not imply any compromise or any um, negotiation of any kind with WikiLeaks. They were basically, they understood our request. And that was the beginning of a relationship between, yeah, Ecuador WikiLeaks, but it was also the beginning of a personal relationship between myself and, and WikiLeaks and Julian himself. So that was obviously key a year later when all the doors were closing for Julian's freedom and liberty. And as we know, the last resource for him was to look for protection. And he looked for the protection of Ecuador and I was happy to help him with that, yes. But there was quite a long process before he was given uh, asylum, is not correct? Oh, yes, yes. Basically, according to the international legislation on, on political asylum and on political refuge, the country that receives the request, it has to look at it, it has to analyze and it has to verify that the claim of persecution is justified. And that's what we did. That's what we did. We knew quite a lot about the case already because that relationship with, with Julian. But since the day Julian arrived and formally stayed inside the embassy, that was um, a nearly two months period when Ecuador looked at every claim, basically approach every country involved in the case, Ecuador approach, Sweden approach uh, the UK, approach the United States, and I understand approach Australia as well, in order to analyze the case. And at the end, we took the decision to grant him political asylum. You understood your government at the time that he was being persecuted, that would be he'd be endangered and, and unfairly um, treated if he were to go back to his own country, maybe, or to Sweden, certainly. Uh, if he left the embassy. So he needed the protection. You concluded that, your government. That was really evident. It was yeah. totally evident that he won't have a fair case in the United States, that the reason he was being persecuted judicially, politically, was uh, the journalistic activities that humiliated the United States. Basically, his request did not have anything to do with, with the Swedish case. It was all to do with persecution from the United States. And as we saw many years later, the claim of a 
secret of pseudo secret grand jury cooking charges of espionage for those publications proved to be totally right, totally, totally true. The same grand jury in Virginia state, what's known as the espionage court, was cooking those charges that he's facing now. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, not long after he entered the embassy, there was quite a dramatic scene where the police were threatening, the British police threatening to enter the embassy in what would be a violation of the Vienna Convention to, to arrest Julian. Did he have asylum yet? Or was it that was that in those couple of months period when he was still waiting to get it? And I believe you were on the scene because in the film Hacking Justice, we see you there when the police are outside. Just describe to us when that happened and what it was like. Well, that happened the very day before we got to the asylum. Ah. In fact, the British, I think they had the intelligence that Ecuador already made its decision. And the threat of raiding the embassy, I think it was aimed to, to dissuade Ecuador of taking that step. So that was a formal official threat. They wrote uh, what they called, um, and that was an official letter basically saying, we will be entitled to go into the embassy. Yeah. If, if uh, we understand that the embassy is not being used for the functions, diplomatic functions that uh, go with the Vienna Convention. Uh, but that was against the Vienna Convention. They, they were basing that threat on British legislation. Mm. Uh, but the, the, the written threat was also physical. They surrounded the embassy uh, with many, many policemen, police cars. They basically stopped the traffic during the night. They really wanted to intimidate us. At the time, we did not have any security guards at the embassy. They were just us diplomats, the ambassador, myself, and WikiLeaks team, but we did have plenty of uh, video cameras uh, inside recording every, every movement. Uh, and I think it was good that they realized that it was gonna be a huge, huge mistake to do that. Not only against the Vienna Convention, not only a breach of international legislation, but they will put in danger every British embassy anywhere mm. if, if if they go after a foreign embassy why not in other countries somebody can raid the british embassy so they stepped back from that and next day ecuador got signed so maybe it was a bluff they were just trying to intimidate you as you say they knew that that would have been uh, their last chance to try to get you to deny the Asylum. We're bringing in now Emmy Butlin. Emmy uh, is one of the leaders, I would have to say, here in London of the pro Assange movement, the support system. Emmy, when did you first get involved with the Julian Assange movement? And when did you first start going in front of the embassy on what seems like a, a regular basis? Already there was a popular support um, for Julian Assange in London all through his extradition case, uh, going through the British courts um, already during 2010 and 2011. I did not participate in that. At that time, I had a young family and I was very much based at home, but I was active online in various forums, social media, and following the case very closely. I did also participate going around to see uh, Julian speaking on occasions when he was in London. Um, but the crucial point that made me realize um, how absurd the situation was and how this man's life was in danger when he sought political asylum inside the Ecuadorian embassy. I come from a country, Greece, with a very turbulent political um, history. I was born in 1970 in the middle of a Greek janta. 
seven year military rule, which was brutal. My family was unfortunately targeted and uh, my parents suffered. Our apartment was often trashed, looking for materials, flyers. I grew up with a sense that democracy is something very precious and that we cannot take it for granted. So when I saw a publisher, someone whose work I applauded from the comfort of my kitchen, applauded um, all the amazing revelations we heard about wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, was actually seeking political asylum to protect his life. That resonated with me very strongly. And that is when I started naturally going outside the embassy. From the 19th of June, 2012, I joined others continuously till the 11th of April, 2019. I would go on a weekly basis. Others were there seven days a week. As the years went back, the solidarity vigils reduced in numbers, but there were a constant week in, week out presence of supporters there. And the basis of it was solidarity, solidarity with Julian Assange and keeping the flame alive and being witness of what was going on in the streets around. And over the years, my goodness, what have our eyes seen? What have we experienced? Um, myself and my colleagues, starting with Jim Curran, who registered the solidarity vigils with the local metropolitan police uh, commander, um, my wonderful, wonderful Clara Campus friend and comrade, who was the backbone of the solidarity vigil over the years, um, wonderful Tom and others, mostly Latin American, and people who had arrived and lived in the UK with political asylum themselves and understood what was going on, formed a small team of people who faithfully and patiently stood there in solidarity. So you arrived the day he went in and you were there the day he, he was arrested? Yes, and I was there every single week. Um, mm -hmm. The atmosphere, what was the atmosphere? It was intimidating because of the very heavy presence of the police, in particular the first few months. Um, the day that Fidel described uh, where the police nearly invaded uh, the embassy, it was the night between the 15th and the 16th of August, 2012. Uh, that night, I stayed up till three o'clock in the morning watching online because there were some people there uh, transmitting the events. And I called my, my mother to beg her, please come and look after the children. So the following day I could join. And this is what I did on the 16th of August. Once uh, mom was at home looking after the kids, I went outside the embassy and I saw what was going on, hundreds and hundreds of people. But I counted with my own eyes 120 metropolitan police officers in uniform. 120. They were preventing us from going close to the embassy. They had blocked the road. And uh, we all waited on tender hooks for the announcement of the Ecuadorian government, which came around midday, just before a group of Ecuadorian people started marching up and down in front of the embassy with banners and, uh, you know, in support of their government and in support of the sovereignty of this nation and what was being done to it. And uh, there about half past one, it was announced that Julian Assange had been granted political asylum. It, jubilations from the crowd, jubilations. And uh, since then, the permanent vigil that was stationed there slowly faded away as the months went by. But we remained and we started getting organized with banners, posters, flyers, engaging and observing what was going on. The police was a constant, constant presence at all times, all through the years, from uh, the 19th of June, 2012 till the 15th of October, 2015, the police was uniform police and you could easily identify them. 
for the first six months had posted a communications van, as they called it, opposite the embassy, with an extendable two meter antenna. Which we always wondered, what was it doing there? Obviously it was for surveillance purposes. Up to eight uniform police were there all the time in their usual attire, but at times they were joined by the rapid response team, which were policemen who have the right to carry guns. And so often they were joined by them, lunchtime mostly, bringing them their lunch. At other times we had a very large number of presence of vans parked on Hans Crescent around the corner, one after the other, often full, full of police. So the surveillance and operation of the police that we experienced and witnessed varied over the years. After the 15th of October, 2015, the uniform police disappeared and we know it was replaced by undercover police. I will stop here for now, thank you. Fidel, let's go back to that incident that didn't happen in 2012 when the police didn't invade. There ensued then what could now be called some good years, relatively good years for Julian, as good as they could be being confined to the embassy. He continued his work as the editor in chief and publisher of WikiLeaks. He had many, many visitors there uh, of all types, celebrities, uh, activists, uh, family, of course, and friends. And you got to be quite close with him. Tell us about, before we talk about some of the more uh, unseemly things that happened later, what were those years like when he could have uh, dinner with wine at that table, when he shared uh, conversation uh, with, with his friends? It seemed somewhat normal compared to what happened later. Well, yes, we have to differentiate very clearly two periods during Julian's stay. One, uh, under the government of Rafael Correa, those first uh, five years, basically. And then when the government changed, everything changed in Ecuador and as well at the embassy. So that first period was uh, basically genuine protection for Julian. Uh, political asylum does not mean at all that you lose rights. On the contrary, you have your rights protected. So the conditions in them, the, the logistical conditions inside the embassy were always very, very difficult because it's a very small apartment. You don't have access to fresh air. You don't have much natural light coming in. Julia has compared it as a spaceship because we were always with artificial light inside the embassy. And as I said, a small apartment, uh, overcrowded at some, some point. Julian was allowed to have visitors, of course, he was allowed to perform his work. He had very small spaces, private spaces for himself and for his work. And it was a respectful uh, relationship between the Ecuadorians and, and Julian mutual respectful relationship with diplomats and all the Ecuadorian staff. The exception always was with the private security company that worked for Ecuadorian government, the Spanish security company. So that was always a bit uncomfortable, even for us, for the diplomats. But otherwise, yeah, as much as we could, we share occasions with Julian, birthday celebrations during those years, the staff was being um, replaced. So uh, welcomings or going away, gatherings, as much as we could, we tried to make it comfortable for Julian. And in, yes, indeed, uh, during those years, Julian, uh, did a lot of interviews, conferences. He edited some books and WikiLeaks kept doing, kept publishing basically. He was very active. He was never bored. I think work, he is a workaholic. 
he only works, uh, but I think that was helping him to cope with the situation, keeping him right. busy and active. Yes. What about his physical health? He had some issues with his teeth, with the shoulder, uh, maybe other things. Now, the British would uh, not allow him to leave without being arrested. How did he cope with that? Well, that was, that was tricky as well, because there are only certain issues that could be that a doctor could see in those premises, just the basic stuff. But for some things, he needed to, he would have to be, for example, scanned by equipment, by medical equipment that cannot be taken inside the embassy. Basically, right. he had something with his arm that could never be uh, looked properly because it was impossible to do that. And yes, we know that the British won't allow him to <laughs> do a medical visit and then come back again uh, inside the embassy. Or some dental care was not possible to perform inside the embassy. It was tricky, that's, that's true. Right. I'm going to ask you, of course, about the change in government and what it meant for Julian, including the UC Global Company. But I want to ask you about some moments when Julian stepped out on the balcony to make announcements. One in particular that's well known is when the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention ruled that he was arbitrarily detained, that the British government should free him and even compensate him. It was, at that moment anyway, a victory. And Julian went out on the balcony. How often did he go out there? And was there a lot of discussion in the embassy whether it was safe for him to do that? Was that his call or was the embassy involved in when he could go out on the balcony and how often he did that? Well, he did that only exceptionally. In those seven years, I understand that probably three, maximum four times, he came out to the balcony and, and made a speech. But obviously it needed to be coordinate with the embassy and with, with Ecuador, yeah? Not only logistically, but uh, politically. Um, after all, he was uh, a guest in, in the embassy. And yes, soon after he was granted asylum, the security company was hired by Ecuadorian government and all the the logistics for his public appearances and his security was obviously something that the, the company took charge uh, outside the embassy, inside the embassy. Yes, they were hired exactly for that. They were hired by the Korea government to protect Julian, and then later it turned dark. Let me go to Emmy for a moment. Emmy, you were outside the embassy. Were you there the day that he made this announcement that the UN Group on Arbitrary Detention, were you there the day he went out with Noam Chomsky and a few other times when he had pretty triumphant moments out on that balcony? I was there for all the speeches that he made. I was not there with Noam Chomsky. That was just, uh, he took a step outside just for the purpose of taking a photograph. A uh, photo mm -hmm. um, with, with Chomsky, but uh, it was um, in February 2016 when we, with great anticipation, understood that um, uh, the decision would be announced. A decision that the United Nations uh, Working Group on Arbitrary Detention had already taken at the end of 2015, but they were obligated to first communicate this information to their relative parties and then make a formal announcement in February. And it was announced and uh, Julian came into the balcony. It was the 5th of February, 2016. And we were there, we were there. We were there and we heard him speak. Every time he made an appearance, everybody just rushed to the scene. We anticipated, we want to see him, we want to make sure he was all right because we're very concerned always about his welfare and well-being. At the same time, there was a very heavy presence of media who were not always, were not always on his side. On that particular occasion, he was hackled by a Channel 4 reporter. It was uh, shameless, absolutely shameless. And we were there to protect him. And also 
show the world and the world's media with our banners, with our presence, that there are people who care about this man and are willing to defend this organization and his work. And that's why we rushed there. We put up our banners, we had music, we made small, you know, distributed flyers, posters, and heard him speak. Always very moving to see him, but it was very, very rare occasion that this happened. We were thrilled. Uh, we were thrilled to hear the news, but yet again, every single time there were good news about his case, he never benefited from it. And that was a proof of the political nature of his, of his in, incarceration in there and his being under siege inside the embassy. That's how it felt. Uh, every single political institution or diplomatic institution used to protect his life was always, always sabotaged by those who controlled the situation, which was the UK administration and the US administration in conjunction. I was speaking with Fidel Navarez, who was the consul at the embassy in Ecuador when Julian Assange got political asylum, and Emmy Butlin, one of the leaders of the Assange support group that was outside the embassy and outside the courtrooms later on as the process began. Fidel, things started turning dark uh, around March 2018. With the new government of Lenin, Julian Assange was cut off from the internet. Uh, he could no longer do his work as before. And things really started turning badly, even inside the embassy. Now, I believe you weren't in there anymore, but what do you know about that decision to cut him off and, and how Julian reacted to that and how things started turning uh, in a really bad direction for him? Yeah, with the political change in Ecuador, everything changed. Basically, Ecuador stopped protecting Julian. And the new government was making everything possible to end the asylum. To begin with, they tried to break Julian uh, in order for him to give up uh, voluntarily. And basically, they tried to harass him to the point that he will give up. Uh, obviously, he was not going to do that. I was still at the embassy when the government cut his communications and basically isolated him. I witnessed myself when he was told that he was not going to have an internet connection. He was not going to be able to make phone calls or use his mobile phones. And he was not going to have uh, any visitors allowed except for his lawyers. To begin with, we didn't think that was going to be a long-term decision. Uh, we thought that maybe a couple of weeks, uh, but that period extended for nearly seven months. During that time, I left the embassy already, so I did not experience the full uh, isolation, but I have very good information how it was. It was tough, it was uh, tough for him. When the government basically realized that that was not going to work, they changed tactic and they impose very draconian conditions for his stay in the future, yeah? So they were, basically conditioning the asylum to those domestic and living conditions that he needed to respect. The government was basically deciding who can visit or who cannot visit Julian and basically what he can publish or not publish. It was, it was, banana peels on the floor in order for him to fool and end the asylum. And that's what happened at the, at the very end. Yeah, the government took excuse that Julian was interfering with the affairs of uh, friendly countries to Ecuador. And that was in breach of the political asylum with its own, no sense, obviously. We had already 
I think, uh, agreed the handing over of Julian directly with the United States and with the British, of course. Uh, tell us then about, um, well, there was some, a lot of friction between Julian and some members of the staff, even with the ambassador at some point as things got worse. Do you know about that? Well, I was not at the embassy during those, that last year, basically, but all the staff was replaced, the diplomatic staff, new ambassador, new diplomats, who came with the mission to harass Julian and to expel him. And I understand there were frictions, obviously. Uh, um, the security company was also replaced and there were frictions as well, obviously. Yeah, That's a key part of the story, obviously. Um, but I wanna ask you, why, why did Ecuador's government change this policy? Did they act on their own, in your opinion? What was their reasoning for this? Why did they change what? Change the, towards the, Julian. No, they changed their uh, no. attitude towards well, no, Julian no, no, Sanchez. They changed, change of politics, change of politics. Uh, basically they were, they needed to please the United States. The Korea government stood up against the United States pressures and Moreno government wanted to, to please them, gave up. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and Julian was part of, of that, obviously. Now the security company was hired by the Korea government, but then it had a radically different a job when Moreno came to power, we now know from testimony in UC Global that trial in in Madrid th that there was a secret agreement, at least secret to Julian Assange and the rest of the world between this company and the CIA, and that uh, tapes were brought from the embassy to the CIA, and then ultimately there was the twenty four seven live stream, and they actually taped him with his doctors and even more significantly with his lawyers. Uh, you had no idea about this at the time you were there, right? Is that right, Fidel? No, no, we we never knew for certain that um, they were spying for their party. We were always uncomfortable with the with the behavior of the company. We always saw that it was unprofessional and too intrusive with everything, with everybody, particularly Julian and his visitors, of course. We thought that was that was one of the reasons why the company was replaced because it was already unbearable. But the company who came later was even worse in terms of the harassment and the and the and the spying on on, on Julian. So we didn't know the Ecuadorian government for certain didn't know that the first company, UC Global, the Spanish company, started to secretly work for the Americans. Yeah. And you need to understand that these security companies are kind of mercenaries. They will work for the one who offers them a better deal. Yes, that unfortunately, that's what happened and, and there's ongoing judicial cases against the company. Yeah. There's always been a disinformation campaign against Assange going back to 2010, even earlier, uh, and dealing with the Swedish case. But there were also all these stories coming out about Julian's bad behavior inside the embassy, that he was making himself an unwelcome guest, that he was doing unseemly things with the cat, et cetera, et cetera. Tell me about your experience with Julian's conduct inside the embassy. No, as I said, the relationship between Julian and the embassy staff, the diplomats, the Ecuadorians was always, always very respectful one. Mutually, us towards him, him towards us. Despite the very difficult logistical conditions that we had there, there were exceptionally some incidents with the security guards from this private company. And as I said, these security companies are kind of mercenaries. In order to justify their work, they produce 
misinformation about the insights of the embassy, portraying Julian as a conflicted person, portraying Julian as a, a person who needs to be disciplined by the security company. So in order to justify the need of them, they produced these reports, which were, by the way, confidential reports sent directly to Quito, to the Ecuadorian intelligence agency, who was the contractor for the, the security company, who, by the way, was not King on Julian either. Yeah. So the embassy staff, not even the ambassador, we didn't know much about these reports. When at some point those security company reports were leaked, we all realized that there were no sense, that they were untruthful. And at some point we didn't pay many attention to that because they were written by those hardly literate security guards, very nonsensical reports. But unfortunately, those were the base for those stories about conflictive Julian inside the embassy, disrespectful Julian, untidy Julian, which is mostly, mostly, mostly untrue or exaggerated or missing miss is a misinformation yeah now the uh, tension continued to increase in the embassy there was an attempt at a break-in at some time in 2018 into the embassy and then of course uh, we lead up to the arrest but before that we learned first in the extradition hearing because of testimony from two witnesses in the uc global case in madrid and then later from this yahoo news report that the central intelligence agency actually discussed trying to kidnap Julian from the embassy, possibly poison him, that an embassy staff member warned Stella Morris at the time, now Stella Assange, not to come back because they were stealing DNA from the baby's nappies. What did you know about this? Or how did you react to hearing all of this stories about the CIA plotting to maybe uh, kidnap him from the embassy that you worked in? It's always shocking to hear and to realize that they were going to those extremes but otherwise it wasn't much surprising for me because I never trusted the security company. Uh, we always knew that we were surveilled and, and surrounded by intelligence agencies, uh, the British and the Americans. And basically that was just a confirmation that all our suspicions and our fears were basically justified. Yeah, on those testimonies, right. the, the security guards told us how the Americans, for example, had laser microphones aiming to the embassy windows to listen to us. So, yeah. Yeah, it was uh, shocking, uh, but not as much surprising for me. Now, Emmy, back to you. Um, in those days leading up to the arrests on April 19th, it became uh, increasingly clear that something was happening. Uh, there were these unmarked police cars, uh, plainclothes people inside, parked right in front of the embassy. Um, uh, it seemed like any day would happen, and then it finally did. Tell us uh, what you experienced being in those days leading up and on the day of the arrest. What did you experience? First of all, just to explain that since the, the 2015, when the uniform police uh, disappeared and was replaced, we were aware, we were aware of uh, what was going on, the surveillance outside the embassy. Um, a flat opposite where we stood at number 18 Hans Crescent in the first floor apartment, constantly had its windows open, um, whether it was rain or shine, and we soon attracted our attention. We noticed that in that building, loads and loads of people were coming in and out. Uh, furthermore, we noticed that uh, an electricity company was digging up the pavement to supply high voltage to that particular building, exclusively to that building. And you kind of 
trying to figure what was going on. We had no idea, but we were thinking it was the British police, the British undercover police having an operation from there. And of course, we could see the camera, the surveillance cameras all over. Now, building up to that time, it was evident and we could hear that the Ecuadorian government's new position, its realignment with the US foreign policy and its collaboration, it was evident. And we kept hearing that any day now, Julian Assange was going to be his political asylum terminated and he was going to be surrendered to the police. We tried as much as we can to hold vigils out there. Already the March 2018, we had asked uh, Kieran O'Reilly, who is a Catholic worker, to um, come and keep vigil as much as he could in those crucial days when his internet was cut off. And he accepted, he accepted to do that. And we supported him 24 seven by, um, during the day having people support his vigil, so he was never alone. But um, after that, when his internet, um, when he was allowed visits, um, we returned to our regular vigils. And coming up to uh, March, 2019, we intensified our vigils and tried as much as we can to keep constant watch, but it was impossible, impossible to know when, when the event would take place. We were talking, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And we all decided whatever happens, we're going to follow him, wherever they're going to take him. If they're going to take him to a police station, we'll go there. If they take him to the courts, we'll go there. And we just watched in horror events unfolding in front of our eyes without having any sort of control over it. When he was uh, taken, there was no one from our regular vigil holders present, which was a great disappointment to us because we were unable to intervene, which we would have if we were there. But of course, we must understand that the moment of his arrest was carefully planned. And just like Julian Assange was surveyed, so were we, and so we still are. It's a very difficult situation to find yourself in, wanting to do so much more from what you're capable of doing as a human being. But we watched and witnessed, and even after his arrest, we went out there and we stood witness as inside the Ecuadorian embassy, his personal belongings were being photographed. We watched the flashes of those cameras going over again and again and again, every single, every single item that he owned. We saw the new Ecuadorian ambassador with his helpers inside talking and we peered through the windows to see what they were up to. They threw some of his personal belongings to the street, in the dustbin. Uh, one of us tried to recover part of his belongings, but it was impossible. He was intercepted. Um, it is a very traumatic event, but it was a very eye-opening experience. And it only made us more determined to continue our support of Julian Assange and to try to do what we can as simple citizens, no more, no less, to defend him. And we have seen since his arrest, the support swelling, swelling around the world. And it's a great hope that eventually he will prevail as long as his health allows him, as long as his health allows him to survive physically. He will be victorious. It's the only way. Both you and Fidel followed very closely the legal process that ensued after his arrest. We including... did. We did. Yeah. 67, we organized about, I was counting the other day, uh, 64 actions outside Westminster Magistrates Court, Old Bailey, Southern Crown Court, Woolwich Crown Court, High Court, 64 actions, solidarity actions outside. We followed him. We were faithful to what we said we were going to do and follow him where he is. And we continue our solidarity vigils outside HMP Belmarsh where he is and elsewhere in London. How would you assess overall the way this political, uh, political, it is a political process, I meant to say judicial process, and maybe that was a good Freudian slip there, uh, has taken place. Uh, what kind of due process has Julian had? What are your overall views of how it's gone for him and where he stands right now on the eve of the Home Secretary deciding whether to sign the extradition order or not? I think his legal team has done an excellent job in putting out in the public domain and in the historic record the achievements of WikiLeaks and the persecution against him from the establishment. They have done an excellent job putting all of that out in the public domain. What remains 
is for people who are involved in political processes to take up the button and run with it. Already the campaign has done tremendous uh, steps forward. Gone are the days, gone are the days, and it was just a bunch of people outside the Ecuadorian embassy and his inner circle trying to protect him. Gone those days. Now you have the Council of Europe Human Rights Commissioner on his side, every single human rights civil organization in the West and, and beyond on his side. A very clear understanding of what is at stake. All these are achievements, achievements of everybody involved in defending freedom of the press, defending human rights and defending him, Julian Assange, as the publisher of WikiLeaks. What is evident to all by now First of all, that Julian Assange was right, was right from the very, very beginning. And second, that this case will only be victorious in the political arena, which where it belongs. I can only speak from myself and for the public, the people who have stood beside me hundreds, thousands of them, and hundreds of thousands around the world to say, we do what we can, we play our part. Politicians now have to play their own part. And we put them in front of their responsibilities about how this case is going to end. This case is of a stark proportions because Julian Saunders is a publisher. He received classified material, published it in the public interest and a vindictive government of the United States with their allies here in Britain have teamed up to punish him and the way any tin pot dictator would do around the world, any totalitarian society that throws away a journalist who's published uh, inconvenient and, and damaging information about them. It's encouraging, Emmy, that you say that the awareness of this case and what is at stake has grown so much with press freedom organizations, human rights organizations, and members of the public. We hope uh, those who want Julian to be freed that Pretty Patel's feeling that pressure. Fidel, um, before I ask you about your take, because you were also in the courtroom. We saw you in February 2020 uh, uh, queuing up to get into the courtroom. Um, was there any, uh, maybe you don't have an answer to this, but is there any anecdote that you could tell that has never been told about Julian that showed his character or something that happened in the embassy that you witnessed? I have a couple, but... Um... I think I need to keep them for the moment for, for the book is being written. <laughs> okay, gonna be, all right. <laughs> it's going to be out soon this, this year. Um, but as I said, as I said, um, despite the conditions, uh, those five first years, Julian was able to, to work, to do what he enjoys more. Uh, he was suffering for certain, but um, he gave interviews, he published, he received people from many parts of the world. That was one of the things I most value from this experience. The amount of people from all over the world that came to express solidarity with him uh, and with the country that was protecting him. That was a great, great experience for, for everybody in the embassy and, and in particular for me that that was so close to Julian. And I need to mention that Julian became Ecuadorian as well. In fact, strictly legally speaking, he's still Ecuadorian. There is a legal process in Ecuador that hasn't finished yet. They are stripping him out of the nationality. And I, as, as Emily said, I am confident as well that uh, he will prevail. He will prevail on this, this fight. But that victory, in my opinion, is not because the judicial system was fair to him. It's not because that the politicians realize that they're being unjust to him is because they felt the pressure from, from the public, from people like 
like Emily and all the support group from people like uh, you, Joe, and all the uh, journalists who always campaign for him is, is because his family, his partner, uh, his lawyers, of course, all the people who don't give up, don't give up. I know that it's not just about him, it's about basic human rights for everybody. Yep. Fidel, last question for you. Um, the United States and Britain are very fond of talking about defending press freedom around the world. They condemn nations for human rights abuses. Those nations almost always are ones that they have some strategic or geopolitical feud with, whether they're full enemies or just adversaries. Uh, they're always talking about what others are doing, often in developing countries uh, where people there's no due process, there's no rights for journalists are thrown in jail, et cetera. Were you surprised uh, by just how outrageous, if I could say that, the legal process has been against Julian Assange when they accuse other countries of these things and they seem to be doing, having done this themselves? I was a little bit surprised. Uh, when I look at what happened in the, in the court during those years, uh, I had higher, higher expectations from British judicial system in particular. Uh, seeing how the defense have refuted every single allegation against Julian, seeing how clear this is a persecution, political persecution. Uh, it was for me obvious that they needed to refute the, the, uh, the, the extradition that they needed to deny the extradition. And they haven't done so. They haven't done so. So, so yeah, I am, I am surprised to the extreme that they, they can go. Yeah. Well, Amy, we'll give you the last word. If they want to see, be seen as a democracy, as they claim that they are a functioning one and in the world, uh, what does their behavior in this case say about that? Even there is no separation of powers between the judiciary and the executive power in this country, because you have a high court that relies on diplomatic assurances to influence its decision. Diplomatic assurances have got nothing to do with the law or with case law. It has everything to do with a diplomatic political tool. And so they accept a political tool and upon this, they rest their decision. On the other hand, the political powers, Priti Patel, I know so from having written to my member of parliament who replied uh, when I asked about her decision, he, he, she said, Priti Patel is going to give due respect to the British judiciary. So they are passing the buck one from the other. They are referring to politics and then they refer to judicial uh, authority. But actually the two, very clearly work in conjunction with the other. So you have a revelation in front of our eyes about the corruption of our democratic system and what we hold dear in this country when the judiciary and the political executive are acting hand in glove and there is no separation of powers. So for beyond, beyond the aspect of press freedom, beyond the aspect of human rights, we are understanding that the way this case is progressing is corrupting for the entire democratic system that we rely on. So it is a very, very urgent call to action, very much like Niels Meltzer, the former United Nations Special Rapporteur on Torture said, is a call for action for people to take action everyone what we can do no more no less in putting our footprint in this very very important struggle and path towards reassuring and re-establishing the rights the democratic rights that generation upon generation of people that have come beyond before us have sacrificed their lives their blood their sweat to achieve for our societies. This is what is at stake, is whether we are able to preserve those rights for the future 
or we are willing for these rights to disappear, disappear for us and for our children. So I encourage everybody, find the thing that you can do to support Julian Assange, to defend him, and to finally secure his freedom and do it. That's all we can do. Thank you. Thank you, Emmy Butlin and Fidel Narvez for joining us on CN Live. And we will be back soon when Priti Patel makes her decision.